finally can chat about lymphatic system. Um, I feel bad now, I just realized I forgot to update something. I will tell you what I forgot to update on that lecture, okay? No worries. So just one little, little fact about lymphatic system. Anyway, it's a drainage, it's a sewage. Remember when we discussed the um, capillary filtration, the, the blood flow through the capillaries? And we talked about the arterial end of the capillary and the venular end of the capillary. Okay, so in the arterial end, the net flow of fluid, fluid goes where? Into the tissues, right? And on the venular end, out of the tissue, back in the blood. Um. <laughs> Now this this flow of <laughs> this flow of fluid flow of, flow of fluid um, into the tissue and back in the blood. The amounts that go each direction are they equivalent? No. Which one? Which which flow? Which amount is bigger? Into the tissue, right? So um, this. It's going to be bigger than that, which means some fluid remains in the tissue. Does that make sense? Now, this fluid that stays in the tissue, what does it contain? What What is it, essentially? It's plasma. It's pretty much plasma. Okay? So, if you have something accumulating in the tissues, you better let it go away. Okay? So lymphatic system does exactly this. About three liters of the fluid that leaves your blood every day go drain into the lymphatic system. You can see this this here. The fluid from the capillary bed goes into the lymphatic vessels. That makes sense? Look at this. This this picture is a little better. So you see this black arrows, this black arrows represent the fluid in the tissue that drains into the lymphatic vessels. So lymphatic system uh, incorporates several organs and a whole bunch of vessels. Okay, so vessels. You start with the capillaries or capillaries. Capillaries when they merge. They become collecting vessels. Collecting vessels, when they merge, they become trunks. And trunks merge and form two lymphatic ducts. That clear? Capillaries, collecting vessels, uh, trunks and ducts. That idea of vessels merging, which other vessels? It reminds you of the veins, right? Turns out lymphatic system, lymphatic vessels structurally are somewhat similar to veins. Does that make sense? When fluid from the tissues enters the lymphatic vessels, it officially starts to, na to be named a lymph. Uh, if you ever really badly scratched or injured the, the muscle, for example, you sometimes can see the if you damage the lymphatic vessel, it's yellowish fluid coming out. When I first time saw it, I fell from the bicycle and ruined my machines. It was pretty bad. I, I looked awful. Uh, the clotted blood, well, of course, and that, then something yellow started to seep out of my legs, and I was, I was freaking out. I said, I'm about to die, and my mom told me, no, that's fine. I'm going to be good. Um, so, lymph, any question? No. So, lymph, if you think about this, lymph, the good analogy for lymphatic system is the sewage, really. So, when sewage, 
and I'm not talking about septic tank, I'm talking about the city sewage. So there's a there's a pipes, okay, that drain the sewage into the central system. Where does the sewage go? Where does it go? Treatment plant. Yes. You have to filter it. Okay? At least. In the water treatment plants, there are a lot of things going on with the sewage. In human body, you have to filter the lymph. Because God knows what's in there. Is that clear? So the filtration of lymph happens in the lymph nodes. This little bean-shaped organs, parts of the lymphatic system, essentially stop and contain uh, debris fragments, pathogens, dead cells, just huge chunks and pieces tissue that can end up in the lymph. Does that make sense? Now, which lymphatic system isn't the continuous system like respiratory or digestive or circulatory? You can see something? It just ask me because I know sometimes I have, I have short, I'm short-sighted, so sometimes I have to ask what's on the board. So don't hesitate, okay? Um, so, lymphatic organs aren't continuous. There are several of them. The largest one is spleen, of course. Okay. You can see it right here. Thymus. And then you have uh, different locations where there are patches of follicular lymphoid tissue, like tonsils. Okay. Palatine tonsil, lingual tonsil. Various patches, and of course appendix, various patches. These are fragments of immune tissue that are located in your intestine. Well, not in the intestine, but in essentially in the wall of intestine. Okay? Does that make sense? Why intestine? Why you have immune tissue in the intestine. It, it, okay, it absorbs the word waste, but waste, you mean fecal matter. Well, fecal matter, you will expel it. It's one of the activities of the digestive system. What is another, the most important? What do you do with your digestive system? Huh? But before you break down, you have to do what? Uh, before absorbing the nutrients, you have to huh? you have to eat. And when you eat things, are they sterile? No. So all this crap that's on your meal can get into into your body, right? Through the digestive system because you absorb the nutrients. Does that make sense? If you want, we're going to do one fun lab next week. We're going to check in micro. We're going to check for the fecal contamination of different things, including greens from breakers. I can update you on the results if you want. Um, OK. So what I was talking about? Oh, organs, yes. So that's pretty much, you can see that the immune system is Fairly, the lymphatic system is fairly diffuse. Some organs are not like very much connected. Thymus has, a, for instance, separate role in the entire immune system. Okay. You can see here on this depiction that actually uh, lymphatic vessels form a pretty dense network. Okay. What is interesting about these lymphatic vessels is that lymph flows in one direction. Okay? It goes from the tissues to the blood. In, in a way, you can think about spleen and lymph nodes as little water treatment plants, lymph treatment plants, that remove all the 
pathogen and, and debris from the lymph and return clean fluid back into the blood. Is that clear? So vessels, <clears throat> capillaries, capillaries or capillaries are very similar to uh, blood capillaries. There are some differences though. First of all, extreme permeability. That permeability allows them to take um, from tissues things like uh, dead cells or pathogens, right? Another difference is that if you think about it, since it's one-way system, the vessels have to have a start. Because if you think about blood vessels, they don't really have a start. It's a, it's a circle. We call it a circuit. There's no point where vessel just starts from, from, from scratch. Okay, So lymphatic vessels have to start from something, uh, and they start with so-called valve okay so lymphatic valve is when two endothelial cells do not form tight junction but overlap each other like a flap so when pressure pressure of extracellular fluid increases the underlying portion of the flap opens and fluid extracellular fluid gets into the um, lymphatic system. Does that make sense? You know, think about this. Remember we talked about inflammation. One of the signs of inflammation is edema. Physically, in the tissue, what is edema? Accumulation of what? Fluid. Where? Not in the skin, anywhere. In the what? In the tissue. In the space between the cells. Now, why there is an edema? Why there is a swelling? Why, when you, when you fill up the bathtub, why water stays in the bathtub? Because you have, uh, huh? Yeah, so you have a plug, right? Now, um, I noticed one interesting thing in every bathtub that I saw in the States, the amount of water that rushes I, like waterfalls from the faucet massively exceeds the draining capacity of the drain. So if you leave it running to full scale, your tub's going to be filled anyway, which means you pour more, more water than your bathtub can drain. Swelling means that your vessels leak more fluid in the tissues than lymphatic systems. Lymphatic system can drain away. Does that make sense? It still drains, just doesn't comply capacity-wise. Okay. Um, there are no blood, no capillaries, lymphatic capillaries in the bones teeth and bone marrow. Two years ago, it was discovered, lymphatic system was discovered in the brain. So this statement is no more valid. There are capillaries in the brain. Imagine what it means for the science like anatomy. We know anatomy of the human pretty good and two years ago the guy discovers actual lymphatic vessels in the brain. That was pretty awesome. Okay. Does that make sense? We talked about uh, some of the uh, capillaries, the lacteal. Okay. They have a role not so much in the immunity as much in transporting fats from the uh, intestines into the blood. Does that make sense? So, collecting vessels, they Pretty much the, every lymphatic vessel looks like a vein after capillar, uh, capillaries, right? So there are some next to the skin, some are deep, right? And they have fairly thick walls already, so they 
walls are on par with the thickness of the venular walls, so they gotta have vasovasorum, they gotta have their own blood supply. And it makes sense, because extracellular fluid is not actually oxygen rich. Okay, so those cells will be starving. Trunks, the biggest vessels. There are four pair trunks, so lumbar. They here, okay. Bronchomediastinal, they here. Subclavian, here. Jugular, here. And intestinal trunk. It runs pretty much through the abdomen. So all these trunks, they become, they bigger and bigger, the vessels become bigger and bigger, and they collect lymph into two ducts, right lymphatic and thoracic duct. So right lymphatic duct drains the right upper arm and right thorax. Okay? Left, everything else. Okay. Um, one little question. It's it's a little bit far fetched observation. I don't know the evolutionary reason for that. But think about this. You have one uh, one duct that drains specifically this part of the body. You have another duct that drains everything else. If we go back and look at the heart. And we'll look at the, well, it's a bad picture of the heart, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm not saying that I'm going to do a good one now, okay? But if this is the heart, it's even better. And this is the aorta. There are three vessels that go from the aorta. Do you remember them? It's an embarrassing question. Huh? So, which subclavian? Left subclavian, brachiocephalic trunk, left carotid. Well, it should be left carotid here, left subclavian here. Now, if you would look at it, you will see that aorta has a branch that serves right arm and right thorax. And everything else is the rest of the body. It delivers the blood to the rest of the body. Is there any evolutionary significance, any evolutionary meaning that the right part of the chest, right arm, is separated from everything of the body? I don't really know. Just a little observation. Okay? Like brachiocephalic trunk serves that part of the body. I don't know, but it's just just a neat neat thing. Okay. Um, so the duct, the two ducts, they empty into the veins, and essentially, um, so they empty at the merging point of the jugular and subclavian veins. Okay. So we would look at the anatomy. Of the um, of the system, you see. First of all, you see a bunch of lymph nodes, but that's okay. Collecting lymphatic vessels and so on and so forth. This picture represents the trunks. Okay, so you have two lumbar trunks, one and two. They sort of follow the pathways of the uh, common iliac arteries or common iliac veins. Okay, and these guys merge. At the cisterna cali and form intestinal trunk okay now intestinal trunk um, branches out okay and then you can see right and left well, here's going to be left bronchomediastinal trunk okay you can see jugular trunks that go from the head subclavian trunks that go from the arms okay and the eventually the ducts are going to be entering here so you see the 
the duct, lymphatic duct, and you see the lymphatic duct here. I will tell you what you have to know for the anatomy. It's not going to be a lot. Okay? So you see the largest vessels. Okay? Trunk, 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 trunk from the head, trunk from the arm, trunk from the thorax. Trunk from the head, trunk from the arm, trunk from the thorax. Does that make sense? Lumbar drain legs, intestinal drains, the lower abdomen and intestines and abdomen, okay? Uh, the bronchomediastinal drain the upper thorax, left and right side, subclavian drain arms, jugular drain head, and they all end up getting into the ducts, okay? Um, one thing that before we move on, I want to focus your attention, where lymphatic nodes, lymph nodes are. Most of, well, they're actually everywhere, okay? But a lot of them are in the cervix, it's called cervical lymph nodes. You can feel them, okay? A lot of them in the groin. Um, when, yeah, well, it's kind of an awkward experience. When um, back home in Russia, we have a draft military. So it's not voluntary, you're not signing up. So at the age of 18, actually early, I think, seven, at age 16, uh, you get registered at special, like, draft control organ, something like that. And you have to go through the medical examination. Mostly, so they look, if you are psychologically and physically healthy, uh, so you go through a bunch of doctors that couldn't care less. So they check for, like, if your vision is okay, if you can stand straight, I mean, if you have two arms, two legs, two eyes, two ears. Uh, one of the things that they check specifically is sexually transmitted diseases. Nobody's going to take any samples from your reproductive system. What they do... They stick arms into the groin and check the uh, lymph nodes. If lymph, if lymph nodes are not enlarged, you probably don't have an active STD. Okay. If they are enlarged, that's the reason for concern. Um, auxiliary. So there's a three, <clears throat> four region, two auxiliary region, cervical region, and groin, inguinal region, where the lymph nodes are abundant. Popliteal lymph nodes, which are not shown in this picture, are less well seen, but they're often present. Where's, where are popliteal lymph nodes? Yeah, behind your knee. Okay. <clears throat> uh, so, <clears throat> how lymph is moved? Obviously, there is no central pump in the lymphatic system. Do you see what I'm saying? There is a pump in case of circulatory, in case of cardiovascular system, which is heart. In case of lymph, there is no central pump. So the only way to move it is by, by the help of other organs. Uh, muscles, first of all. So muscular pump. Respiratory pump. Arterial pulsations, when arteries, elastic arteries, big arteries, when they are engorged with blood, they become slightly bigger, they stretch, okay, they squeeze the lymphatic vessels, okay, um, and there is smooth muscle layer in the walls of the lymphatic vessels, it can constrict, um, it contributes somewhat to the lymphatic flow. Does that make sense? Muscular pump, respiratory pump, arterial pulsations, and constriction of the smooth muscle in the vessel wall. 
which cells we can find in the lymph nodes. Let's, let's think. So what is the function of lymph nodes? Huh? To cleanse the lymph. So you have some really crappy fluid. Okay? So what do you need to clean it from first? It has like chunks of cells. Hmm? Again? In the lymph nodes? Yes, there are going to be macrophages, absolutely. Okay? Um, when you imagine what, if you design water treatment plant, there's sewage. What you're going to put first? Filter. You need to get rid of, get, get rid of like pieces of wood. Okay? So for this, we've got reticular cells. You can see the reticular, reticular cells that produce reticular fibers. And those reticular fibers form kind of a mesh inside of the uh, lymph node. Does that make sense? So when lymph enters the lymph node, the big chunks, the big fragments, cells, whatever, they, they get caught in the web. Okay? <clears throat> Macrophages will destroy them. Not only this, you're also going to have the dendritic cells there, which brain freeze will also phagocytose the pathogens to present the pathogens to lymphocytes. Is that clear? Let me remind you something. What is the uh, process of lymphocyte maturation? Lymphocytes, in which organ they're produced? Bone marrow. Okay. And then we have two types, T and B lymphocytes. Where do they go next? Thymus and the spleen. No, not the spleen. They remain in the bone marrow. And then they mature in the bone marrow. And when they matured, where do they go? Spleen and lymph nodes. And what do they do in spleen and lymph nodes? What do they wait for? Exposure to the antigen, pathogen, right? That makes sense. Okay? And B cells can be can experience direct exposure. T cells have to be presented with antigen. And that's why we need dendritic cells there. Does that make sense? So <clears throat> Lymphoid tissue is, when we say about, talk about lymphoid tissue, we talk about the place for uh, immune cells to be housed at. Okay? Once the T and B cells are exposed, T and B cells where do they go? Into the blood. So they migrate. Does that make sense? Now, not off topic. It's not going to be on the test. But just a thought, a thought process. Imagine your T cell. You got exposed to the antigen. You go into the blood. But the antigen comes from the microbe that infects a liver. It's like in the liver. Would you be of any use in the blood? Especially if you kill ourselves. Microbe is in the liver. Antigen is in the blood. Well, antigen was in the lymph. You got exposed and everything. And you're in the blood. Where's the, where's the guy I'm supposed to kill? The guy's in the liver. So what you got to do next? You actually will migrate into the liver. Does that make sense? And then they will encounter the pathogen, killing, blah, blah, blah. Okay? So this, is, this process 
it's, it's funny, this word is funny. This process when T cells go to the site of the, the injury site of infection is called homing. They home to a certain place. For instance, if you would look at patients with inflammatory bowel disease or Crohn's disease, they have abnormal homing of T killer cells in their guts. Those T killer cells will attack the gut epithelium and they're going to have a lot of problems. Does that make sense? Hmm? Cytokines and chemokines drive them. Yes, there are drivers. Yes, absolutely. So um, there are two major types of lymphoid tissue. One is diffuse. Another is follicular lymphoid tissue. So diffuse lymphoid tissue means that there are uh, cells, lymphocytes, okay, dendritic cells, macrophages in every tissue. And that's true. If you would look at the um, liver, there are Kupfer cells, macrophages in the, um, in the liver, in the around blood vessels in the liver. If you would look at the uh, gastrointestinal epithelium, Banneth cells can be considered lymphoid cells. They're macrophages. Okay. Um, if you would look at the lungs, alveolar macrophages can be considered a diffuse lymphoid tissue. Does that make sense? Follicles are special agglomerations of lymphoid cells. Right? Um, so follicles uh, can be found in places like lymph nodes, spleen, to the lesser extent, various patches. Okay. So follicles means that it's a, a, a bunch of cells, lymphoid cells, that are close to each other, okay, and they're packaged in some kind of the connective tissue envelope. Right? Um, so one thing that's very important part of the lymphoid follicular lymphoid tissue is the terminal center of B cells. What does germinal mean? Germinate, growth, when they originate, okay? So for this we need to chat about lymph node. Lymph node is an example of the follicular lymphoid tissue. It looks like a, a little bean and it's size of a small, small bean. Okay. Um, it is surrounded by the connective tissue capsule, which is shown here in pretty much in, in green. And this capsule extend, extend itself inside of the node in the form of trabeculae, dividing, sorry, dividing the node in the separate lobes. Does that make sense? Now, the node has every lymph node. It's two layers. The outer cortex and the inner medulla. We already talked about another organ before, just cortex and medulla. Adrenal gland. So essentially, the words cortex and medulla refer to external and internal layers that are functionally different. Hormones of adrenal cortex and hormones of adrenal medulla are different. So here, the cortex and medulla are slightly different as well. So in cortex, there are follicles with germinal centers where B cells divide. Germinal center means that B cells start their development there. Do you remember what B cells develop into? Plasma cells, right? And memory B cells, yes. Plasma cells. You start with the uh, germinal center cell, and through several steps, differentiation steps, B cell becomes plasma cell in the lymph node. And then plasma cell is released, <coughs> sorry, from the lymph node 
into the blood where it produces antibodies. That makes sense? In the medulla, you're going to find both B and T cells, plasma cells that are going to be taken out pretty soon, right? That makes sense? And that makes um, it kind of reasonable, and I will show you why. The flow of lymph in the lymph node goes pretty much this way. Does that make sense? <coughs> so, medulla, sorry, cortex, is B cells that are not producing antibodies yet. They start to differentiate in the plasma cells. Medulla already have plasma cells. They also have T cells that were exposed. So these plasma cells and activated T cells are ready to depart and reach the blood. <coughs> okay. Oh, I'm sorry. <coughs> now, do you have filter at home? Like water filter. Is it fast? Does it filter fast? You're slow. Mine painfully slow. Like it's often. It it doesn't comply with my need for water in the morning. Okay. Huh? No, fridge is good. But in the fridge you have a pressure going through it, right? Does that make sense? <coughs> I have so filtration and if you think about filtration, actually, um, it should be a slow process. Because in the, it, in the slow process, um, especially when you try to get rid of a smaller things, things that absorb on the filter, not like chunks, okay? It, it's got to go slow, okay? So we want, in, in lymphatic system, it's the same situation. We want the lymph to go slow through the node. Why? Cells can, macrophages can, phagocytose, T cells can get presented. Okay, so, so dendritic cells have enough time to present antigen. B cells are exposed. Does that make sense? So, we want to make a, a flow of the lymph. To make it to make it slow, to make it stagnant, and the way to do it is to bring in more lymph than it drains out of the lymph node. Same way as we discussed with the bathtub. If you want to fill the bathtub, incoming water should be more incoming water than outgoing. Does that make sense? This is the reason why. You have more afferent lymphatic vessels than efferent lymphatic vessels. Does that make sense? Um, I want first. Where where did you where did you see the words afferent and efferent already? Huh? Nerve fibers. Afferent. Where do they go? towards the brain. They go into the brain and efferent leave it. Efferent goes in, efferent goes out. Keep this in mind because as we move to eventually move to renal, we will see the same situation in, in the glomeruli of the kidneys. There are afferent and efferent blood vessels. Okay. Spleen. Um, it's the largest lymphoid organ. Sometimes gets removed if people have certain uh, blood malignancies. You can see it in this picture. 
okay? It is a brownish, okay? Red brownish. What makes it such color? Iron. Iron, because spleen is also a recycling plant for red blood cells. Okay? So, <clears throat> it... Now, interesting thing about spleen is that it houses a lot of white blood cells and they multiplicate in it. They grow. In case of leukocytosis, many times T cells, especially T cells, they grow in the spleen. This is why... Uh, sorry, <laughs> Jenray. Uh, this is why when you read the, about the symptoms of certain infections, you will find the symptom splenomegaly, which means T cells replicate to a huge extent and spleen starts to swell. I, when I, when I, I had a mouse that the little guy definitely had some infections and problems. And when we opened him up, his spleen was huge, like huge. Had some, as far as I remember, had some um, urinary tract infection. We don't know how. Probably it was us injecting him improperly. But his one of his kidneys was completely ruined, and he had a splenomegaly. Okay, because of the ongoing infection and T cell replication. And it's a recycling plant. Okay, it stores iron. Okay, and, and in some cases it can be a site of erythropoiesis, okay, in, in children. By the structure, it looks a little like a large lymph node, the same connective tissue capsule. Trabeculae that sort of divide um, it in the compartments. But if you would look deeper, if you would look at the... Uh, types of tissues found in the spleen, you will see that two major types, the, the red pulp, okay, that's where the um, red blood cells are either stored or recycled, and it makes sense, because what's the most, most cherished part of the red blood cell? Iron, not him, not protein, iron, it's iron. So iron that is taken out of red blood cell is recycled, and used for synthesis of him for the new red blood cells. Okay. The organic portion of him is excreted. Does anyone remember what in the form of what? It's excreted via uh, intestine, bilirubin. Yes, it's excreted in the form of bilirubin. Okay. Um, white pulp. Well, white blood cells. Uh, spleen is considered to be not essential organ, okay, not critical for living, so splenectomy is sometimes necessary <clears throat> for people with uh, blood malignancies. A little, and you know, I cannot keep myself away from giving you examples from micro. There's a disease in the United States, uh, it's Babesia. I don't remember the species name, but Babesia, it's a tick transmitted disease uh, commonly found in New York, New York State and around the city of New York. So people without the spleen pretty much doomed. People with the spleen often just fine, but people without spleen, they have really big problems fighting it off. So it is non-essential. People can undergo splenomegaly and be just fine, but it's a component of the immune system. Now, uh, before we move on, uh, anatomically, I don't remember if, uh, if there is a list in a study guide for lymphatic anatomy and if I posted it. Oh, no, 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 I didn't post it. Okay, I need to post the study guide in lymphatics. Yeah, I didn't post the the immunity. Okay, oh, not the immunity, the anatomy of it. 
So for lymph node, for lymph node, afferent versus efferent vessels, cortex versus medulla. Okay? And the follicles. Lymphoid follicles. That's pretty much it. For spleen, it's kind of boring. Well, know that this is the spleen. Okay. Know that this is the white pulp. And know that the uh, red pulp. And know that this is the white pulp. Yeah. I'm not colorblind. I think I'm not colorblind. Um, oh, by the way, what type of uh, pillory is you going to find in this plane? There are three types, continuous, fenestrated, sinusoid. Sinusoid, why? No, that's not big. Huh? A lot of exchange between the blood. You have to get all red blood cells and take them into the red pulp, right? Thymus. This is the kind of a... Uh, we talked about thymus before. It's an interesting organ. It's very active in the first um, years of life. And as people grow older, it decreases. So, I mean... During the childhood, when, when our immune system matures, thymus is active and large. But as we grow older, it, it physically shrinks. And um, in elderly, it's almost non-existent. It's really small. But what is, what is fascinating, it still churns out some T cells. Okay? Maybe it's just because we don't need so much. All right, it's divided, it has two layers, okay, cortex and medulla, all right, separated into the lobules. The main point is that in the thymus, the most pop, populous cell type is T cells, obviously. Interestingly enough, in thymus there are no B cells whatsoever. Okay, so only T cells. What do they do? T cells. What do they do in the thymus? They mature. Yeah, they mature. Okay, hormones like thymopoietin and thymosin, they somehow control the T cell maturation. Right? One of the most fascinating features of the thymus is that it doesn't um, participate in fighting microbes or any other antigens. It's like a school, training center. You don't expect trainees, you don't expect members of police academy to serve on the street, like be a riot police if needed, okay? So Thymus is entirely a schooling place, but there is one important uh, feature of thymus that makes it a perfect school. It is called blood thymus barrier. Based on the name, can you explain what it is? What blood thymus barrier? You want what it is? It's the blood thymus barrier. It's separate. Excellent. It separates the blood and the thymus. That's all you needed to say. Blood thymus barrier separates the blood and the thymus. It prevents any contact between the blood and the cells in the thymus. I'm going to ask the, the tough question. Why? Why there should be absolutely no contact between T cells when they mature and the blood? Think. It's your challenge now. They should, but they learn something when, while they are in thymus. One very important quality. 
it's not learning. It's uh huh. Come on, come on. I come on. Well, they have to be yes, and they actually are presented with an antigen in the thymus. They learn something. They learn to. Okay. T cells have to recognize what foreign. They have to tell foreign from from self. If during quote unquote education they encounter something from the blood, what can happen? They may perceive it as foreign. Does that make sense? There is another thing. If they encounter something foreign from blood, there is a chance that they respond to it as self. Does that make sense? Something sneaky that gets into the thymus and presents itself as a self antigen. Well, guess what? There's a virus that infects thymus, presents itself to the T cells. So T cells will not recognize it later. Hmm? No, it's, it's a mouse virus. It's a memory mouse memory tumor virus MMTV causing obviously memory tumors um, it's actually HIV model in mice it works a lot of like HIV um, now malt mucosa associated lymphoid tissues that's what berries patches that you may have heard first time tonsils okay it's still a follicular uh, lymphoid tissue, okay? Tonsils, Paris patches, appendix, right? Digestive, any part of digestive tract, respiratory tract, uh, genitalia, reproductive tract, anywhere the pathogen, the microbe can enter the body quite effectively, okay? Uh, mucosa associated lymphoid tissue, when people say it, they often refer to the lymphoid follicles that surround the intestines in the uh, mucosal layer of intestines. But also you can find mucosa-associated lymphoid tissue in the form of tonsils that surround the, the pharynx. Okay? A pharyngeal tonsil next to the connection between the, the, the pharyngotympanic tube and the pharynx. Palatine ton tonsil at the base of the tongue, lingual tons tonsil, sorry, and the tubal tonsil. Okay, um, they are constantly exposed to the pathogens. They, since we inhale and we eat, and when they're exposed to the pathogens, they produce B cells. Hopefully, the problem with tonsils is that they capture the pathogens. And they can get inflamed. And the chronic inflammation of tonsils is called tonsillitis. Removed? Uh, uh, often it's a consequence of, like in the sore, people who get sore throat, chronic sore throat or frequent sore throat, they can be diagnosed with tonsillitis if there is a microbe uh, pretty much living on tonsils living in those tonsillar crypts. Yes? No, it's, a, it's an acute inflammation. So if people have... It may be an allergy. I have it, I have it from pretty much all apples. The only apples I can eat is deer apples from uh, that sage farms in Chardon, which is convenient because like five bucks, ten pounds, something like that. Everything else, any apple that I buy in any grocery store, I get itchy throat, I get itchy lips, I get itchy mouth. It's, it's horrible. You can't eat apples. I don't know if it's an allergy to apples or that liqueur 
that they used to make them pretty. Okay, but sore throat. This this sore throat, the tonsillitis, is infection of tonsils, chronic inflammation of tonsils, and they can be removed uh, pretty easily. Um, we're not going to talk about developmental aspects. Don't worry. Now this aggregates of lymphoid follicles. It just shows you the picture here, the um, the Paris patches. So those are bunches of lymphoid follicles in the mucosal layer, okay, of the intestines. A lot of Paris patches are in the appendix. They are spread through the small and large intestine, of course, but there are a lot of them in the appendix. And it's interesting. Um, what is the role, okay? Appendix is filled with microbes, normal microbes. And one of the ideas now why we need appendix is that microbes that are normally present in the gut shape our immune response, actually. Does that make sense? Not only nutrition, they shape we respond to them in a certain way. So removal of the appendix may not be the ideal thing. Okay. Um, speaking of the anatomy portion, I will put down the list of lymphoid lymphatic structures that you have to know. But essentially for I told you about the lymph node and the spleen, okay? Nothing fancy about the thymus. Here, the tonsillar crypt. And if you look at... Where's the guy? Not this guy. One of the guys. Yeah, this guy. So know these organs. Okay? Know where tonsils are. Know we where thymus, spleen, lymph node. If I if I point at this and I ask which organ is that, which part of lymphatic system, lymphatic system, don't tell me it's an intestine. Tell me it's a Paris patch. That makes sense? Okay, yes. That's okay. Uh, respiratory and lymphatics anatomy going to be together. So respiratory is small and lymphatic is small. I'm going to throw them together. Yes. No, no, no. It's okay. Yes. Say it again. I just didn't hear. No, no. Yes. No. Lymph refers to the fluid that's in the lymphatic vessels. It's not a blood. It is derived from blood and will return to blood, but it's not the blood. By the way, speaking of lymphatics, I it's a good time to bring it bring it up now, that example from clinical practice. People who undergo well women that undergo radical mastectomy. Have you heard about that operation? Procedure, radical mastectomy. It's a removal of a breast, usually as the result of uh, breast cancer. And frequently, very frequently, mastectomy, even if it's not very radical, <clears throat> involves removal of uh, the lymph nodes. And if lymph nodes are removed, what is also disturbed? The flow of lymph. Now, if the flow of lymph, right, uh, right side mastectomy, okay, lymph nodes on the right side are removed, axillary lymph nodes are removed. Can lymph go from the right arm to through the to the eventually uh, the right lymphatic duct? It cannot, or it can, but its flow will be severely diminished. What's going to happen to the right arm? It's going to swell. Now, it's the, you're absolutely right. It's going to swell, and you can see it in patients who underwent mastectomy. Next question. 
how do they treat it? They can drain the lymph. There is another thing that comes from... Yeah, yes, they put compression sleeve that increases the hydrostatic pressure, okay? And literally decreases the filtration of the, the capillary, net capillary filtration in the capillary beds in the arm. And you can drain the lymph of it. Yeah. Yes, yes, they have to constantly wear it. Does that make sense? That's just, think, now you know how it works. I think it's pretty neat. Okay, uh, 